We are not slaves of the past, nor servants of the present, but masters of the future. A. J. Darkholm, Rise of the Morning Star. Rise of the Morning Star is the first book in the self-help fantasy series, The Morning Star Chronicles. It is the story of a man whose life is not going how he once thought it would. He works hard, but it seems like no matter how hard he works or how good he is, things just do not go his way. At his breaking point, he goes all for broke and starts taking back control of his life, soon realizing the power of his choices. But those choices do not come without consequence. The more he changes things and starts to manipulate the people around him, the more it begins to change him as well. Keep these words in mind as we progress through my remarks about two remarkable women, Ona Judge and Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman and Ona Judge were two 19th century women whose lives were not going how they would have liked. They worked hard, but it seems like no matter how hard they worked, things just did not go their way. They both went for broke and start to take control of their lives, soon realizing the power of their choices and the changes that choice can bring. They both had to face consequences. The more they changed and started to manipulate the people around them, the more they began to change. Ona Judge is a lesser known of the two women. I'm going to assume that most, if not all of you, are familiar with Harriet Tubman because she and her work have been well documented. Should you want to know more about Ona Judge, there is a recent book written about her titled Never Caught by Erica Armstrong Dunbar that you can locate on the internet. I'll say it again, Never Caught by Erica Armstrong Dunbar. I selected these two women for how much they were alike and how much they differed from each other. One was a slave of the most powerful man in the country and lived, for an enslaved person that is, a rather good life. She was well fed, nicely clothed, and in the company of the best that society could offer, but she was enslaved. The other was a lowly field hand who was beaten and ate scraps. Their common denominator is that they detested enslavement and resisted, never to forget their decision to resist and to be proud for making that decision. Ona Judge Stain was an enslaved woman who served the man and women who were referred to as the father and mother of this country, George and Martha Washington. This is May 2020. Ona Judge took her freedom in 1796, well over 224 years ago. In many ways, we have grown as a nation. We fought a war, the Civil War, that legally ended this disenfranchisement of men and women of African descent. In the, uh, in the 13th Amendment, 1865, we received the right to be free citizens. Both Miss Tubman and Miss Judge were women who were enslaved and tired of being in that condition. They took their freedom because they knew it would never be granted to them, and they were at their breaking point. Not taking, now, taking that freedom uh, required the help of others who worked in an organization called the Underground Railroad, which was filled with resistors. There are many heroes and heroines who were part of that underground world. But for today, we're just going to discuss Ona's story in detail and in Harriet's story. They both exhibited cunning and bravery, but I want to make it clear from the outset, they would not have been able to achieve their goals without the support of members of the underground railroad. So this is a salute to those brave individuals who risked life and fortune to assist in the freedom of those held in bondage. First, I'll give a very general outline of slavery in the colonial era and all up until the Civil War. Uh, Then we'll discuss Ona's days with George and Martha Washington and their relationship with Ona Judge and other enslaved people that worked for them. And from there, we'll discuss uh, what happened to Ona when she resisted and took her freedom. And then we'll move on to Harriet Tubman, her life as a a slave, and her life as a runaway slave who helped well over 300 
enslaved people also resist and run away. In 1619, 491 years ago, a Dutch ship brought 20 African slaves ashore to the British colony of Jamestown, Virginia, or rather Port Comfort, Virginia, which is really closer to Hampton. Throughout the 17th century, European settlers in North America turned to slavery as cheap labor um, and uh, for, they depended upon them to make their businesses successful. African slaves worked mainly in the tobacco, rice, and indigo plantations of the South uh, and along the Chesapeake Bay colonies, which included Maryland and Virginia. But do not mistake slavery as strictly a Southern institution. Slaves were in every state, including New Jersey, and New Jersey was the last Northern state to abolish the institution with the ratification of the 13th Amendment, as I said previously. After the American Revolution, many colonists, particularly in the North, where slavery was relatively unimportant to the agricultural economy, began to link the oppression of African slaves with their own oppression by the British and called for this abolition of slavery. Stay right there. Okay. You might not know that one of the first martyrs to that was Crispus Attucks, and you've most likely heard of him, who was, as we also know, another resistor. Um, although slavery was never widespread in the, as widespread in the North as it was in the South, many in the North grew rich on slave trade and investments, so there was resistance to the abolition of slavery up here. Um, our own cities of Camden, Patterson, Jersey City, Elizabeth, the town that I grew up from, um, grew rich off of slavery and the slave trade, for they provided equipment needed for the implementation and proliferation of the trade from the production of luxury items demanded by those who grew rich as a result of slavery. Many of the abolitionists who were in the North, and they resisted and suffered too, based their activism on the belief that slaveholding was a sin. Others were more inclined to the non-religious free labor argument, which held that slaveholding was regressive, inefficient, and it made little economic sense. Free Blacks and other anti-slavery Northerners have begun helping fugitive slaves escape from Southern plantations to the North via a loose network of safe houses as early as the 1780s. And this would have been near the time that Ona Judge took her freedom. Um, the Underground Railroad helped somewhere between 40,000 to 100,000 slaves reach freedom. And it was certainly used by Ona Judge who was, was assisted in her escape while living in Philadelphia by the network of freed black men and women in that city and white men and women in that city who were abolitionists and or Quakers. We also know that Harriet Tubman was a captain on the Underground Railroad, influencing and assisting countless people to the North uh, and Canada via the Underground Railroad. The story of Ona Judge. And I'm sorry, you can go. I miscalculated the slaves, you can go, okay. In her first newspaper interview printed in the Granite Freedman of Concord, New Hampshire on May 22nd, 1845, Judge was asked if she regretted her escape. She replied, no, I am free and have, I trust, been made a child of God by that means. Perhaps some of you have been to the Smithsonian Museum of African American History or to the Smithsonian Museum of American History. I believe it's at the street level of that museum where the inaugural gowns of the First Ladies are on display. That of Martha Washington is here. A short but stout woman, Martha's gown is quite intricate and ladies of the day wore multiple layers of clothing, clothing including corsets and pantaloons. Remember, this is the day before sewing machines, so all garments would had to have been sewn by hand. All garments of Martha's class, Martha Washington's class, would have been dressed to perfection on a daily basis. Ona Judge would have been responsible for keeping Martha's wardrobe in pristine shape. 
she might have even made the dress that we're looking at because she was her personal seamstress and sewer during that time. Martha traveled to winter camps to be with her husband, George, and would have had to have played an integral part in shaping his ideals and in perfecting the personality of the man we would learn about from the earliest days of our schooling. She was in Morristown, New Jersey. She was in Elizabeth. She was in Newark. She lived with him as first lady in New York City and Philadelphia. Ona Judge was her personal slave since the age of 10 and would have been with her during all that time. She would have been by her side during Martha's frequent teas. She would have known her most intimate friends and her thoughts. But what did Martha know about Ona? and the other enslaved persons who worked in the Washington household. Next to nothing, but their worth as servants. It was a great shock to Martha and George when Ona Jug, Judge resisted and took her freedom on May 21st, 1796, while the household of President George Washington was stationed in Philadelphia. They were in the midst of preparing to retreat to Mount Vernon for the summer. Judge prepared her escape. She simply walked out of the house while the family was eating dinner. Her motivation was clear. She was aiming for complete freedom from slavery. Judge was born uh, at Mount Vernon, uh, the Washington's homestead in Virginia around 1773. She was the daughter of a dower slave, Betty, who was of African descent, and a European American indentured servant and tailor, Andrew Judge. Like her mother, Judge was a skilled seamstress. By her own account, she was never taught to read or write while living out at Mount Vernon, nor was she exposed to any religion. At age 10, Judge was incorporated into Mount Vernon's labor force. So she was working full time at the age of 10. Always a personal favorite of Martha Washington's, Judge was one of the handful of slaves brought by George and Martha Washington to New York in 1789, when Washington assumed the presidency, and then to Philadelphia in 1790 at the start of his presidency. However, she was never kept in Pennsylvania for more than six months at a time to avoid establishing a legal residency that under Pennsylvania law of the 1780 and act for the gradual abolition of slavery would have freed her from enslavement. So if you were an enslaved person, but you stayed in the state of Pennsylvania for six months, continuously for six months, you were then allowed to petition for your freedom. The Washingtons knew about this, which is why they were headed to Mount Vernon for the summer to break up the six months that Ona would have been there and other enslaved people in the house. Much is known of Judge's life um, in comparison to Washington's other slaves as a result of newspaper interviews she gave in 1845 and 1847 while free as well as newspaper ads that were a result of George Washington's frustrated attempts to recover her after she resisted and ran away. Judge's escape from the president's mansion in Philadelphia was most likely inspired and facilitated by her exposure to free blacks in a city with fervent abolitionist spirit. Her motivation was clear complete freedom from slavery. Judge had learned that she would be given to Elizabeth Park Custis upon Martha Washington's death. The promise of continued enslavement after the Washington's death cemented Judge's decision to risk her relatively comfortable position with the family and board ship secretly to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Back in Philadelphia, Mrs. Washington felt betrayed and claimed that Ona must have been abducted and seduced by a Frenchman. She wrote that Ona had always been well-treated and even had a room of her own, a big luxury for an enslaved person. 
the First Lady urged the President to advertise a reward for Ona's recapture. But Washington refused, realizing how unpopular that would be for the nation, who was still examining and questioning the theory of the rights of men and women, and a thread of abolitionist spirit still permeated the country. After all, he was president, and if the president's slave was discontent, out the window goes all the theories about happy and docile slaves. Ona was in Philadelphia for over a month before she left Philadelphia by boat for Portsmouth. During that month, it was members of the Underground Railroad, remember a whole group of resistors, who sheltered and fed her and made arrangements for her escape. Where exactly she stayed, how she exactly booked passage, how she made contacts in New Hampshire, that's not known. But it is known that she could not have done these things without support from an underground network of friends. This is the house that the Washingtons lived in in Philadelphia. Late in the summer of her first year in New Hampshire, Elizabeth Langdon, daughter of Senator John Langdon of New Hampshire, spotted Ona walking on a street in Portsmouth. Elizabeth was one of the Washington's granddaughter, Nellie's closest friends. She was a very frequent visitor to the president's house in New York and in Philadelphia, and reportedly a classmate at the same Annapolis finishing school. Ona avoided Nellie's friend, but either Elizabeth or her father wrote to Washington telling them where Ona could be found. Washington asked Secretary of the Treasurer, Oliver Walcott, to handle the matter. And the, he wrote to Joseph Whipple, who was the Collector of Customs in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, requesting his help in the return of the President's wife's property, Ona Judge. Whipple made an attempt at complying with what must have seemed like an intimidating order, but warned in a letter that abducting the girl and placing her on a ship headed south might cause a riot in the docks, for there was much abolitionist sentiment in Portsmouth. Whipple did meet with uh, Ona, interrogated her, and reported to Walcott that, quote, after a cautious examination, it appeared to me that she had not been decoyed away by a French lover. The Washingtons were sure that there had to be a man, or more importantly, a man who was a love interest of Ona's, who convinced her and arranged for her flight from the Washington household. They did not give Ona enough credit for making the move on her own. They didn't think that she had enough strength or intellect to resist. After all, who would want to leave the president and the first lady? It was not a French lover, but a thirst for complete freedom. There was no limp love interest involved except for the love of the idea of freedom. Scared, lonely, and miserable, Ona tried to negotiate through Whipple. She offered to return to the Washingtons, but only if she would be guaranteed freedom upon their debts. They were old at this point. An indignant president responded in person to Whipple's letter. And it says, and I quote, to enter into such a compromise with her as she suggested to you is totally inadmissible. It would neither be prolific or just to reward unfaithfulness, the unfaithfulness of running away, with the premature reference um, uh, to my, my demise. What kind of message would this send to other servants who have been loyal and worthy and far more deserving than herself of a favor? This is the Langdon household in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is still standing. Ona was left for, alone for a while, but two years later, Washington's nephew, Burnwell Bassett Jr., traveled to New Hampshire on business. He was entertained by the Langdons in this house that you're seeing on the screen, and over dinner, mentioned that one of the things he hoped to accomplish during the trip was the recapture of Ona. This time, the Langdons helped Ona 
who was now married to a sailor named Jack Staines and the mother of a child. Word was sent to her for her family, word was sent to her by the Langdons, who were now abolitionists, to immediately go into hiding, for the Washingtons were trying once again to capture her and to return her to slavery in Virginia. Bassett, however, returned to Virginia without Ona. Once again, she eluded capture. Her life as a free woman was difficult. Her husband died only seven years after marriage. He left her poor and with three small children. She outlived two of her children, two of her daughters. Her only son joined the Navy, but was lost at sea. She was forced to live on public assistance and with other people without the fine dresses and the fancy foods that she was accustomed to as the favorite personal slave of Martha Washington. May 22nd of 1845, Ona was interviewed and she was asked if she regretted her escape. She replied, no, I am free and have, I trust, been made a child of God by the means. Meaning she was introduced to the Bible and she took pride in learning how to read and was hence introduced to religion and taught to read and found faith in God. On two separate occasions, Judge was confronted by George Washington's aides to return to Mount Vernon free of punishment. She refused, as she was still not guaranteed freedom after the deaths of George and Martha Washington. George Washington was offended by Judge's willingness to bargain with his aides and concluded that her disloyalty and ingratitude in running away should never be condoned by giving in to such demands. A prey to bring return to her owners, Judge lived a shadowy life that was isolated and clandestine. For almost 50 years, the fugitive slave woman kept to herself, building a family and a new life upon the quicksand of her legal enslavement. She lived most of her time as a fugitive in Greenland, New Hampshire, a tiny community just outside the city of Portsmouth. Because of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, which Washington signed into law in Philadelphia, probably in his private office, barely a dozen uh, feet from where Ona slept while she was there, she lived the rest of her life as a fugitive. Ona Judge Staines died in Greenland, New Hampshire on February 25th, 1848, at the age of 75. This is the town of Portsmouth during the time that Ona would have been there. It was a seaport city. Good move on. And this is Harriet Tubman as a young woman, not the typical picture that we usually see of her. Harriet Tubman was not the exclusive and favorite servant of her owners. Harriet Tubman became an icon after her death, but she was a slave an abolitionist and a conductor on the Underground Railroad, a Civil War soldier, a nurse, a spy, a scout, and a social reformer. There was no hiding in the shadows for her. Miss Tubman was born into slavery in Dorchester County, Maryland in 1820 or 21 on the plantation of Edward Brooks. Her birth name was Arminetta but she changed her name to Harriet as a young child. Harriet was her mother's name. From a young age, Harriet was rented to neighbors to do housework, a task she was never good at and was beaten by her own owner and those that she worked, that she was leased out to work for. She was eventually assigned to permanently work in the fields. At the age of 15, she suffered a head injury when she stood in the way of an overseer trying to catch an uncooperative slave. The overseer threw a weight, and that weight hit Tubman, who sustained a concussion and was ill for a very long time. She was to suffer seizures for the rest of her life. About 1845, three years before Ona Judge's death, Harriet married John Tubman, a free black man. Shortly after her marriage, Harriet found out that her mother uh, should have been free on a technicality 
upon the death of a former master, which meant that Harriet Tubman should have been free since the child took on the status of its mother. She tried to protest, but her protests were thwarted, and the case never came to court, but it gave Harriet thoughts of freedom and what that might mean, which led to a great resentment about her position as an enslaved person. That same yearning for freedom that inflicted on a judge also infected Harriet Tubman. In 1845, Tubman heard that two of her brothers, I'm sorry, in 1849, Tubman heard that two of her brothers were going to be sold into the Deep South. That gave her the idea that she and her brothers should escape to the North. Her brothers would not go, so Harriet made the escape to Philadelphia on her own. She returned to Maryland the next year to free her sister and her sister's family. And over the next 12 years, she returned to the South some 18 or 19 times, bringing more than 300 people out of slavery. Tubman was a good organizer. She was only five feet tall and looked rather frail, but she was smart and strong and not afraid to carry a rifle and not afraid to use it. She used it only to intimidate pro-slavery people, but also to keep slaves from backing out. She could not risk the leaving, them leaving her and exposing her to capture. She said, quote, dead Negroes tell no tales, end of quote. After the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, um, and escaped people were subject to re-enslavement, if caught, Lyona, Miss Tubman began taking people, people, I'm sorry. If caught, Miss Tubman began taking people further into Canada, and she had to be extra careful as she herself could have been recaptured. But her ability to lead such large numbers of enslaved out of bondage made her a legend during her own time. During her early years as a freedom fighter, she would take up residence in Cape May, New Jersey, where she would work as a maid to pay for her freedom trips. The passage of the Fugitive Slave Act necessitated that she change her residence from New Jersey further north to upstate New York. There were too many slave captors lurking around in New Jersey because New Jersey is the southernmost northern state. So she took residence in upstate New York and Canada, which was firm abolitionist territory. And in addition, New Jersey was always on the fence about freedom of slaves. When not rescuing, Ms. Tubman developed her oratorical skills and began speaking publicly at anti-slavery meetings and eventually at women's rights meetings. Remember, she did um, all this as a fugitive who had a bounty the slide says 40000 but that bounty eventually went up to $50,000 on her head, a very large sum of money for the mid-19th century. With the money she earned from her speaking engagements, she purchased land in Auburn, New York, and eventually rescued her parents and her brothers from slavery in Maryland. She tried to rescue her husband, but went and found out that he had remarried in her absence. She continued to lead expeditions out of the South right up into and during the Civil War. She was never captured and during the war, she served as a spy for Northern military units. She is known as the first woman in this country to actually lead a military raid. In July of 1863, she led troops commanded uh, in what was known as the Kambahi River Expedition disrupting Southern supply lines by destroying bridges and railroads and freeing more than 750 enslaved men and women. General Rufus Saxton, who reported the raid said, this is the only military command in American history where a woman, black or white, led the raid and under whose inspiration it was originated and conducted. Slide please. Slide, okay. After the war, Tubman remarried and helped to raise several children. However, her public life did not end. She continued to lecture, 
She became a businesswoman selling home baked goods and root beer and continued to uh, talk about advocating education and jobs placement for those freed after the war. She was also a big women's rights and women's suffrage speaker. In 1896, Tubman spoke at the first meeting of the National Association of Colored Women an organization that still exists. And she died at her home in Auburn, New York in 1913 of pneumonia. Can slide please. This is her with uh, some of her family members up in Auburn. Slide please. Okay. Judge and Tubman lived during different times. And although both enslaved during the early part of their lives, once they achieved their freedom by their own resistance, lived their lives on their own terms. They both struggled in their freedom, both constantly on the run and eluding capture because of their legal enslaved status. And with both the uncertainty that the con continuation of that freedom uh, with heavy bounties on their heads. They preferred their post-enslavement life of poverty on the run than living with their masters in servitude. Judge never saw a family member in her post-enslavement life. So for over 50 years, she did not see her brothers, her sisters, her mother, her subsequent nieces and nephews. Tubman lost her husband and was never again to see some of her siblings as a result of her running away or of her resistance. Judge and Tubman were both free long before they took their physical freedom. Resistance to their situation began as a small thought with no possibility, uh, but they had to free themselves mentally first. And in both cases, carefully calculated how to obtain their physical freedom. So their mental freedom, their mental plans for resistance took root long before they actually ran away. Resistance to their physical condition overcame everything else because their mental state had morphed from that of an enslaved person to a person of free thought, which led to the resistance to physical enslavement. Resistance became their mantra, and as a result, they attained their freedom. So let us all be diligent in assuring, in whatever tools we have in our possession, understand the power of self-love. Understand the power of freedom and all that we should do to possess that freedom and that power for ourselves and extend it to all that we meet. As Dark Holmes said in Rise of the Morning Star, we are not slaves of the past nor servants of the present but masters of the future. Okay, thank you, that's it.